un dottorato SIS che non era ufficiale per la legge italiana. No. Sì, sì. So, maybe we can start. Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce the speakers of today. That is Raffaele Resta, that is coming from the University of Pisa. Uh, Raffaele is a sort of a, a guest, a, you, the frequent guest here at, at the DAPC. Since I moved here in 2014, probably we met four or three or four times. Eh? And it's always a pleasure to discuss with you. And Raffaele will stay at the, to the end of, the, of this month. So just before to start, let me summarize the lo very long CV of Raffaele. Just a few key, key things that are that Raffaele got uh, is a uh, is a is a he studies in physics in 1969. And then for a while he was uh, in Pisa at the, at the Scuola Normale in Pisa. Then for a while he was still in Pisa at the university. And then he was appointed as a at the CISA in Trieste when the CISA was started in the beginning of the 80s. And since the, the 83, Raffaele uh, is in Trieste, either at CISA or at the University of Trieste. And today, uh, Raffaele is very well known uh, uh, worldwide for his work on the on the berry phase and uh, the problem of of uh, insulators. And today, he's going to tell us about the fundamentals of DC conductivity. Please. Thank you. Maybe it's better if I turn in this way. Since, since the camera follows me, I will have to stand in this way. And but the, the camera is up. Yeah, yeah, but and to advance. Ah, yes. At once I have to click there. Okay. So uh, um, I'm happy to be, be here again after everything has become again normal. I was able to escape in February 2020, just a few days before international borders were uh, locked down. And our friend uh, Giorgio Benedetti was trapped here for several months instead. Now, now I'm, I'm Life is normal, I started working and, and I'm happy of visiting again once more uh, this wonderful place and wonderful institute. So uh, I will speak about conductivity, This only DC conductivity. Oh, no, that's uh, not so <laughs> I can to do this. Yeah, so uh, you, you all know that uh, conductivity, linear conductivity is defined by a Cartesian tensor. You apply a macroscopic field on the beta Cartesian direction and you look to the linearly induced uh, current density, DC current density macroscopic in the alpha Cartesian direction. This is the definition. <laughs> this tensor is, can be partitioned in the symmetric and anti symmetric components. The anti symmetric always gives a current which is normal orthogonal to the applying field, so it is a whole current. The, long, the symmetric part, if the material is isotropic, is, is scalar, and if it is anisotropic, it is a, a, a symmetric tensor. There are at least, at least three di directions along which the current is parallel to uh, the field. Now here we will focus mostly on the DC conductivity, not on the conductivity of finite frequency omega. And it is important that in, in, the, in the while the conductivity is real in the time domain, the Fourier transform is complex. It always has a, 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 a real and an imaginary part. We focus on the DC. That means that we focus on the real part when omega is zero. But of course, you have also an imaginary part, which is necessary because of causality by uh, because of the Kranich-Kranich relationship. Uh, the real part and the imaginary part are one, the Hilbert transform of the other. So if you know the imaginary part, you also know the real and, and, and the reverse. Now, the motivation why I, I worked on this problem and why I am giving this seminar. The linear conductivity, the whole conductivity requires the breaking of time reversal symmetry. And in a normal Hall effect, the time reversal symmetry is broken by an applied field. In the anomalous one, it is that you don't need an external field, it's broken internally by the material itself, for instance, because the material is ferromagnetic. So it breaks time reversally. There is kind of microscopic, if you want, uh, internal uh, field. 
since uh, in uh, theory uh, the B field is a mess, you have uh, you have uh, Landau levels of standard butterfly all the life. So I focus here mostly only I would say on the anomalous one. Both the normal and the anomalous were discovered about uh, 150 years ago by Hall. So both both are new, both are all effective. This sense it has discovered by Hall. The reason why I entered this field is that I discovered, thanks to Ivo, who, who pointed it to me, this paper, this paper by Sodman Fu, which had a big success. Today it has 355 IZ citation, and there are a lot of papers on, on nonlinear conductivities of, of any kind, experimental and theoretical. Now, also, it is interesting to me because it, you see in the title there is a very curvature, of course, uh, and this is uh, the reason why I'm interested. Uh, I don't like too much this paper. Uh, this, despite, besides the message, I don't like to much this paper because uh, it is semi-classical. It, it makes uh, the conductivity. So I think things can be done better, more elegantly, and more fundamentally. Uh, also, I even don't like the title because very curved dipole. I told to Sodeman why dipole. There is no dipole there. I say because it has the same symmetry as a dipole, right? But if it has the same symmetry as a dipole, it is not a dipole. Anyhow, this is so. I decided to to look at the, the at the problem from scratch, and I wrote I wrote a comprehensive paper, which is here, published just at the end of last year. And uh, uh, this paper is uh, is very dense with algebra. I don't I don't will present all of the algebra which is in that paper. But what is important is the method. That is, I say, it, uh, we 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 don't want uh, conductivity is a first order response. So you typically would do uh, perturbation theory, some of the states, something like that. And of course, if you go to second order, third order, you, go, you get a mess because second order perturbation theory, third order perturbation theory is, is very complicated. So conductive longitudinal DC, and, and, and uh, until you limit yourself to DC conductivity, doesn't need Kubo formula, doesn't need the uh, uh, perturbation theory, can be done just as an adiabatic response. So uh, the, the talk of today will be a kind of lecture on conductivity, and I will rewrite the well-known results but I would say in a innovative way. And then the, the, the new part, which is the nonlinear, would remain just a, maybe at the end, I have time, but it is kind of simple exercise once one has understood the linear conductivity on, on a different ground. Now, we start with a classical theory. A classical theory is, uh, sorry, this is the, this is the, the outline you can see I will first discuss the, the linear longitudinal conductivity, first the classical theory, then generalities about the quantum theory, and then a little bit uh, uh, parenthesis about boundary condition to be used. When you solve Schrodinger equation, you have also to decide which boundary condition you like to use. Then uh, the fundamental uh, tool which allows to go to, to, to deal with the problem is the theory of adiabatic electron transports, on which I have a couple of slides, very, very <laughs> fundamental. And then, uh, uh, equipped with that tool, I will approach the famous uh, uh, theory of DC conductivity by Walter Kohn, time honored, that was appeared in, in a milestone paper in 1964. And I show that it can be generalized. Uh, and, 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 but uh, first, I will apply to longitudinal conductivity. I will read the result by Walter Kohn, the famous result by Walter Kohn. Then I switch to anomalous or conductivity, linear and nonlinear. And all of the theory is made at the many electron level. The many electron level that allows for simple notations in a sense, although it's not practical to implement. And then if you want to implement, you implement in the independent electro formulation, that means artifoc or <clears throat> most commonly for metals uh, density functional theory, uh, consham in a crystalline material. Now, the classical theory, which is the first part, it starts the basics, the uh, first chapter of Arshok Mermin. Uh, uh, you remember that the Newton equation of motion are solved for one electron moving or carrier, but don't say an electron moving in a constant field. You have to, to insert, you can insert in the Newton equation of motion of dissipation directly in the equation of motion in the form of a relaxation time. And the formula for the conductivity is uh, the, the following one. 
which has two material dependent quantities. One is, uh, is the relaxation time, and the other is uh, this quantity, the electron density divided by the electron mass. That means it is the inverse inertia of the many electron system. And this concept will come through all of, of, all of the uh, talk. That is, a key point okay. is the so electron the, density, of, uh, sorry, the inverse inertia, inertia of the many electron system, which is measured by the conductivity. Uh, if, you, if you do the, if you take the, the uh, static one, omega equals zero, of course, you get the Ohm's law, where you have a, clearly a, a contribution of both, of both uh, um, material dependent properties. Now, in quantum mechanics, in sharing equation, it is impossible to insert the dissipation directly into the equation of motion. You cannot write sharing equation with a, a, a relaxation time. So uh, this can be done a posteriori, heuristically. So you have a formula and then you regularize by inserting by hand a, a relaxation time. There have been recent uh, recent calculation where instead the contribution from uh, typically in quantum mechanics dissipation is the simplest case, say the most fundamental uh, uh, origin of dissipation is the interaction with phonons. So the interaction or can also be modeled by interaction with a, a, a system of bosons. So you need really to 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 deal more or less explicitly with the interaction of phonons with some bosons, typically phonons. I will not do, th do that. I will study only in the dissipationless limit. That is, in which case the formula, which is on the on the uh, uh, Ashcroft Mechanics textbook, if you take this limit, you take this limit when tau goes to infinite. Of course, you no longer have the Ohm's law. You have, by definition, you take this limit and you get. Which is a delta plus i over pi. The two quantities are related, as it must be, by Kramer's current relationship. When omega is zero, the conductivity is infinite. This is correct because the system undergoes free acceleration. So if you, you don't have a steady current, you don't have a DC current, you have an accelerating current, and so you have a delta. But what is important, the coefficient in front of the delta is important, is the one that gives you, as I say, the inverse inertia of the many electron system. <clears throat> now, before proceeding to the quantum case, I would like to rederive the formula, this formula, in a different way, and because this will be the way which I use with 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 the uh, with with in the quantum case. But first of all, one ask why are sti we still speaking about the Drude weight about one hundred twenty after one hundred twenty two years from from the theory of Drude. because because even in the quantum case, many things survive. What, what survives that if you have a metal, still you have a free acceleration in absence, in a pristine metal at zero temperature, in absence of dissipation mechanism, you have a free acceleration. And the inverse inertia is measured by a tensor. If you have an, an, isotropic, an isotropic material, you have a, a Cartesian tensor. This tensor is called the Drude weight. Also, in the many body physics, it's also sometimes called uh, adiabatic charge stiffness. Now, also, what is very important, if you take a quantum system of, of interacting electrons, so an electron gas, but you allow them to move in a flat potential, you forget about the nuclei, you forget about the crystalline potential, then the result is exactly identical to the classical one. So the quantum electrons and the, the, the uh, uh, classical electron behave exactly in the same way, insofar as you forget the periodic potential. Of course, when you account for the periodic potential is no longer true, but still you have a quantity which, which accounts for the inverse inertia of the system, and this is called, I say, the, the weight of the material, which is different, of course, from the classical. It is smaller, I will see. So the, the periodic potential hinders the acceleration. Now, see, uh, I take an alternative, as I said, an alternative de definition. I, in uh, in Newton equation of motion, you have explicitly the fields, electric field or even magnetic field. 
In the Schrodinger equation, you don't have the fields. You only have the potentials. You have to choose which potential. So you don't have a gauge invariant formulation of Schrodinger equation. You have to choose a, a vector potential, scalar potential, and you have to solve with scalar with potential. For reasons which will be clear next, I want to re-derive the, the, the results by actual memory uh, in in the vector potential gauge. That means the field is minus the derivative of the vector potential. We we'll do that in one dimension, that's fake. So the free electron Hamiltonian, this is the kinetic energy of a single electron. The velocity is no longer P over M, but it is it, it includes the vector potential. And, of, and the current is just the electron charge times uh, the, the density and times the velocity, which is this. And now, uh, uh, yeah, then since we want that there is no current when there is no perturbation, we, we the initial condition are the P term there is zero. So we have that the current is essentially is proportional to the vector potential simply. You see the current is proportional to the vector potential. And sorry, what do I change? And you can also see that since uh, if, I, if I have a constant field, the vector potential is linear in time. That means the current increases linearly in time, as you would expect. You have free acceleration. We want to go to the omega domain. The Fourier transform is that J of omega is equal of A of omega. And not surprisingly, the coefficient is, a set, apart from a trivial factor, is essentially the classical to the way. Now, uh, conductivity is, by definition, the derivative of the current with respect to the field, we write by the chain rule, a derivative with respect to the vector potential times the derivative of the vector potential with respect to the field, like this. And next we have to, to find what is the derivative of the vector potential with respect to the field. Since the field is the derivative, the, the Fourier transform is just I omega times the vector potential. So a very naive inversion would say that A of omega is equal one over omega times the field, I over omega times the field. This is not true because if the field is the derivative of vector potential, the vector potential is the integral of the field. And in the integral, you have to fix the integration constant, of course. There is an arbitrary integration constant. If you go to the time domain, you retrieve the same integration constant here, of course, multiplies the delta, because you can easily verify that omega times a delta gets zero. So this constant doesn't, doesn't affect the field. And now, what is the right, uh, the right constant? It, again, is causality. That if you want, you, you want to, to, to have a causal response, and you know that the trick to have a causal response is to add an infinitesimal imaginary part in the denominator. Or also, if you, if you think of omega as a complex variable, uh, this inversion would have a pole at omega equals zero, and you want to displace the pole infinitesimally below the real axis. And this is what is done. And by definition, the theory of distribution tells you that the weak limit of the, in the weak limit of, the, in the sense of weak limit of distribution, this is, yes. so you have a delta, here is how the delta appears, and there is a pi. And finally, you put everything together, you multiply, and you find the, the results, which I shown several lines ago. <laughs> All of this is, however, to, 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 promote a key message. That means that the true the weight itself is the derivative of the current density with respect to, to the vector potential. And the omega de dependent factor, which multiplies it, is the derivative of the vector potential with respect to the field. And this will go on even in the quantum case. So in the quantum case, we will, try, we will find for, a formula for the derivative of the current with respect to the vector potential, while instead the omega dependent factor will be the same even in the quantum <clears throat> case. We will carry over to the quantum case. Now, in the quantum case, in a real metal, there is, as I said already, here there is a free acceleration, but it's not all. Sigma of omega, the, 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 if you have a flat potential, the system only responds at omega equals zero. 
if you if you if you uh, uh, probe uh, free electron gas with a, a, a a, a, a field which oscillates a, frequ a finite frequency omega, there is no response. Instead, in a metal, you have two terms. In a real metal, you have two terms. One is the Drude term, which has the same form as the classical, except with a different coefficient, plus a regular path. Uh, I've not found very recent measurements. I, this is a picture of 50 years ago. From The best one I found is rubidium. The authors have these uh, points, measure these points, and then uh, and then uh, plot as a sum of a regular path, which I colored in blue, and a drew the peak, which is colored in, in red. And it, it is not a delta because it's broadened by extrinsic effects. Of course, the first principle theory will not give you the broadening, it only gives you a delta. But the integral under this uh, Lorentzian, I would say, is the same as the drew the weight. Uh, I think I have not found, unfortunately, there are many measurements, even recent, of, of resistivity or conductivity at, at uh, omega equals zero, of course. I have not found uh, figures like that as a thing, function of the temperature. I would easily imagine that if you lower the temperature, the peak becomes narrower and narrower. So the width of this peak should have a very strong. Uh, uh, temperature dependence, but I'm, I've not found, I'm not very good in, 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 in browsing through the literature, but I've not found any, any figure which could be pedagogically on, on that uh, count. Now, as I said already, if I have an interacting electron gas in a flat potential, the reduced weight is the same as the classical. If I switch on a crystalline potential, this through the weight decreases. You have a, a number, a, a, the tensor, which whose diagonal element are smaller, and have a regular path, and the two are not independent; they are related by the famous F sum rule. That means the integral of the conductivity of all frequencies from zero to infinite uh, uh, must be equal to something proportional to the density, which I've written in this form. That it means it's proportional to the density, density over mass, more exactly. And the integral, of course, the, the Drude peak is one half, and then you have this path. So going back to the, so when we switch the crystalline potential, we transfer some spectral weight from the Drude peak into the regular path. And then if the crystalline potential is very strong, then the Drude peak disappears, we have an insulator. Insulator has a zero acceleration, zero Drude peak. There is no steady current in an insulator by definition. Now, the, the regular part is a dynamical property. There is no way of arriving at it without a Kubo formula, sum over state, and the like. So we, this is not the, 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 the theme of this presentation. But instead, the, the true the peak is a ground state property, doesn't need Kubo formula, doesn't need, does need uh, uh, perturbation theory. It can be retrieved in, in a different way. And most important uh, for my for the message of my paper, and so I will not give many details here, is that all DC conductivities, longitudinal transverse, linear and nonlinear to any order, are ground state properties of the material and can be retrieved without perturbation. Now, again, as I insist a little bit, the through the weight measures the inverse inertia of the many electron system, it says which. The, the, the crystalline potential, then I have some, something different, but still, still different inertia in a sense. The different inertia can be cast as an effective density. So this is, this is the effective density which contributes to the DC current. So that's not all of, in a sense, not all of the valence electrons contribute to the DC current, only a part. And is the part measured by the weight. If we rewrite the F sum rule in this form, so you have uh, the, the two terms must sum to something which depends on the density, just multiply by a factor. I, I, I recast that sum rule is the way. On the right, I have the, the, the complete density of valence electrons, the one which appears in a free electron theory, the one which appears in, in I would say, in Ashford Mermin, if you want. This is the effective one coming from the from the uh, delay, and this is the regular terms. 
And as I said, for a given electron density, if the potential is flat, I only have the through the peak, so only the red one. If I have an insulator, I only have blue, the red disappears, and the crystalline metals are, are both. Question, in a real material, how much goes into the blue, how much goes into the red? Even this is not easy to find the literal, but I, I can I assess that in aluminum, in aluminum, the red is two, in aluminum, there are three valence electrons per cell. Uh, two, goes, go, two go into the, the peak and one goes into the blue part. Now, boundary conditions. You know, when you, when you solve the equation, you also have to decide which boundary condition to use. In principle, you are allowed, to, in thermodynamics tells you that uh, the results uh, do not depend on boundary condition in the thermodynamic limit if the system is very large. The two typical boundary condition, one is you, you get a bounded crystallite, so it's a finite system, bounded crystallite with, with zero outside, the wave function goes to zero outside. And the other one, which is the one typical of condensate matter, I would say necessary condensate matter physics, are the born for Kalman periodic boundary condition, toroidal. If you look back at your Kittel textbook, the, 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 the block theorem is demonstrated starting from finite boundary condition, then taking the limit. So all of, of condensate matter physics, in a sense, has to do with, with, uh, with, with uh, but for kind of boundary condition, not only for solid, but even for liquids and amorphous. <coughs> now, in order to describe conductivity, you need a closed circuit. A real conductivity, of course, because you have a battery, you have a current which it goes uh, through the loop, through the battery and the metal, if you say. And so clearly this is very natural. Even if there is no battery, you can imagine a different source of electromotive force like uh, say a time dependent magnetic field or whatever. So for sure there can be a steady current with periodic boundary condition. There cannot be a steady current without open boundary condition and with an open circuit. No, in the, if you have a bounded crystallite uh, of a metal, you take a piece of metal, you plug in an electric field, what happens? It polarizes because you have a Faraday cage effect, of course, but no current flows. So, so there is no do the way. So the question we, we, we came across and we decided to investigate can, in principle, this is not very economical, but just as a matter of principle, can one measure ideally the through the weight in, in a system with open boundary condition? That is, uh, 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 and this is a paper which published in 2020 with my student, Gabriel Bellomia, who now is a CISA PhD student. He was a master thesis, this work. So it is possible to compute the through the way by solving the equation, but by adopting open boundary condition where there is no steady current. And the answer is yes, is a kind of tour de force, but we did only on a one dimensional simple model. But the idea is the following. Uh, you can prove, since the through the weight is the inverse inertia of the many electron system, you can prove the inverse inertia in a different way. That is, you, you, you probe the system with a very low frequency electric field. And uh, if the frequency becomes lower and lower, this happens like a musical instrument. You know, you have from the violin to the contrabass, uh, the, the, the frequencies go down, if you, or, or for, uh, from the trumpet to the tuba, the frequency go down. So even those normal modes, the, the, the oscillations induced by an oscillating electric field, uh, coalesce some of the normal modes, not all, because, because they do the weight, uh, some of them, they coalesce in the omega, uh, zero limit to the uh, to, to zero. And you sum up the, the spe spectral weights of all those modes, you get the, exactly the other way with a good with a good accuracy, with a good accuracy for a very simple model, with a very good accuracy mm -hmm. for a very simple model. This was the message of our paper about the uh, open boundary condition. Uh, Next, uh, I will abandon open boundary condition. We can back to the, uh, uh, to the let's say, uh, honest uh, periodic boundary condition, which I use it for contribution. One important ingredient of the theory is uh, the, the theory of adiabatic electron transport. The problem is as follows. 
suppose you have an Hamiltonian which depends on two time-independent parameters, then the eigenstate depends on the two parameters, the ground state depends on the two parameters, uh, like this. I will not write the parameter here in order not to introduce Baroque notation, but keep in mind that those have, have, have a dependence. Suppose that an operator can be written as the derivative of the Hamiltonian, we respect, for instance, the first parameter. And then you are interested in the ground state expectation value of this observable, of this operator, this one. Clearly, this is, is simply the derivative of the energy. This is the Hellman Feynman theorem, nothing new. But now you want to vary slowly the Hamiltonian. So you want an Hamiltonian which is slowly time dependent. And you ask, what is the expectation value of this operator O, a time-independent operator uh, evaluated of a slowly time-dependent ground state? You expect something which is similar, which is, let's say, a correction to the Hellman-Feynman theorem with some, something else. Yes. And uh, Suppose now that the time depends of H, I use the second parameter K2 in order to, to uh, insert the time depends of the Hamiltonian there. So you have a time dependent Hamiltonian. In principle, I should solve the time dependent sharing equation, but I don't want to solve the time dependent sharing equation. I solve the time independent one at a given time. That means I take a snapshot of the Hamiltonian at some time and I deal with it as a time independent. And of course, it depends on time parametrically because there is a K2 inside. Uh, so the eigenstate state is called uh, the instantaneous adiabatic eigenstate. state. Uh, and then uh, the, the, this is the, the famous uh, result, which to my uh, knowledge is due to New and Taulis in 1984. I don't, we don't see here, but in 1984, in the adiabatic limit, the expectation value of this operator is uh, sa same term as in, in the uh, Elman Feynman theory, minus this quantity, important quantity, k dot, so the velocity times this quantity, which by now is called the Berry curvature. This combination with the, the against, uh, of the eigenstates is a Berry curvature. Was not called Berry curvature in 84 because, because uh, Barry's paper came out about the same time, but by now everybody calls this a very curvature, including, of course, New in his subsequent papers. So, 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 so the 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 the, uh, the very curvature is an essential quantity for the adiabatic uh, uh, evolution of, of, of a system. Now, both quantities here, the derivative of energy and the very curvature, depend on time implicitly. The, the quantity, this uh, result is exact in the adiabatic limit. It means it's exact when k dot is infinitesimal. So if the velocity by which you, you change the Hamiltonian, essentially, the Hamiltonian change with the velocity which is k dot point, uh, 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 which is k dot, then, uh, then this is exact, of course. Uh, and uh, when uh, the velocity is zero, so if you go back to the static case, you retrieve Hellman Feynman as it must be. Now let me use this result next. I only have to say, I only have to decide which Hamiltonian, which parameters, which operator. But I will take the exact as it is. The Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian was introduced by Kohn in the famous paper in 1964. Within periodic, you solve Schelling equation within periodic boundary condition. Uh, and you take an Hamiltonian like this, you have a, a, an electron for n electrons which depends on, on a three-dimensional parameter. We, we will see next what is this parameter. I have, with respect to con, I've inserted an A metro in order to break time reversal symmetry. This is not important for longitudinal conductivity, but is important for transverse conductivity because otherwise it will be zero. So this is kind to, to take to put into Hamiltonian the result of any time breaking uh, effect, like interaction with with the speed, with with, with uh, the spin orbit interaction or something like that. We adopt periodic boundary condition that is the coordinates are angles indeed the angles the potential v is, is the potential of the lattice the potential of nuclei, nuclei plus also the electron electron interaction. And the recipe given by Cohn is since we will take derivatives, you take derivative first and the limit, thermodynamic limit after. So the limit of a large system after taking the derivatives. 
What is K? K is called a generic flux or twist in, in this, it has the dimensions of the inverse length, but essentially it is a vector potential. It is a vector potential which does not depend on coordinates, it's constant in space, is a vector potential in different units, simply. And Kohn only considers a time independent K, that means a vector potential which does not depend on, on space, does not depend on time, that means electric field, magnetic fields are zero. That means this is simply a gauge transformation. So in, in Kohn's formulation, you only insert here a gauge transformation. I will also, instead, I, I, I generalize and I will consider also a, an adiabatically time dependent K. That means having a macroscopic field, of course. Now, uh, what is the operator? The, the Hamiltonian is this. You notice that the, many, the velocity of the electrons, so the extensive uh, velocity of, 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 sorry, I, this is wrong. The extensive, of, this is a mouse error. I should say extensive is the many velocity, the current density is intensive, I divide by the volume. So, so the, 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 there, is a, there is a mistake. Eh? So anyhow, the velocity you see is just the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the flux. Related to the flux or to the vector potential. The microscopic current density is intensive, it's not extensive. I divide by the volume, of course, and multiply by the electron charge. So it's the many body velocity times the electron charge divided by the volume. And then I apply the new Thales formula as it is. For this Hamiltonian, this operator, and those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, parameters, the parameters are just the Cartesian coordinates of the flux. I change of notation a little bit because I would write this as as a as asymmetrical tensor. So this is an anti-symmetrical tensor for any value of the flux. It, it's the notation was this, but in, in present like this, and it is just the Berry curvature of the many-body wave function. The new Thales formula says that the macroscopic current density, which indeed is nothing else than the expectation value of of the of the uh, Macroscopic current density is the expectation value of, of the density of, of the current operator over the time dependent ground state, slowly varying. It, this is the formula which is seen several times. And of course, if there is no perturbation, this is zero. <clears throat> this is zero. So I want to look how this changes when I perturb the Hamiltonian with, with, with the K. The symmetry properties are important. That is, the Berry curvature is odd. In, in exchange when you change sign to the flux and it is even uh, so if there is inverse if there is uh, time reversal symmetry and sorry it, yes it is odd under time reversal symmetry is even under inversion symmetry of course it's both uh, it, both symmetry exists the very curvature is zero uh, uh, at k equals zero at, it's zero at k equals zero but of course it's not zero the derivative clearly and uh, uh, if you want uh, the, the curvature to be not zero at k equals zero, you need to broke time reversal symmetry. Now, the con approach is the following. I will rewrite con results in a different way from the original paper. The derivative of the current with respect to, to the, the uh, flux is just the derivative of the current. So I have a double derivative. And uh, so I have the, the derivative of the current with respect to the vector potential is just this quantity. So essentially is the second derivative of the energy with respect to the flux. <clears throat> now, since the constant vector potential, as I said, a pure gauge transformation, we, we learned since very young that the energy must be a gauge invariant quantity. So why this is this, this energy depends on the gauge? And the answer was given by Kohn. Periodic boundary condition break time break gauge invariance, break time invariance. So so, uh, so and this is exploited very, very cleverly by 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 Cohen, that is exploiting the breaking of, of gauge invariant due to the Bohr von Kahn boundary condition, you get a formulation of, of the true weight. Mm. 
he was again the chain rule. The, the derivative of the vector potential with respect to the field is what we have done already in the classical case. You, you, you remain uh, this one. Of course, if you want that at finite frequency, you need some other state Kubo formula. But if you only want uh, the, the uh, DC case, the C case, it is enough to take derivative with respect to static A, no perturbation theory. That is, I derive with respect to A. And, uh, and uh, when I derive with respect to A, is exactly what the con theory predicts. And so we have the drew the term in the conductivity in this one. So finally, we arrive at the famous result, almost 60 years old, that the drew the weight, or also call it the, the the charge stiffness is the second derivative of the energy with respect to the flux. Anomalous for conductivity. We take our uh, formula again. If we have a constant field, that means the K is linear in time, like this. So, uh, the second term in a new Taoist formula, the one with the curvature, is this one, and uh, uh, and you see that uh, it is an anti-symmetric tensor. Already here you have k point, so you have already the field. So this is the formula you were looking for. The transverse conductivity is time independent when k equals zero. Of course, this is time independent, uh, and you to lowest order you evaluate it at. E. At, uh, to lowest order in perturbation, we evaluate it at k equals zero. So the extra term yields a DC current without dissipation. So the transverse current does not need any dissipation, is already finite without, uh, without uh, realization time. The current is also normal to the field because the tensor is anti-symmetric and can be non-zero even in insulators. In insulators, all, this is the only conductivity can be non-zero. That is, in insulator, all linear and non-linear conductivity uh, longitudinal are zero, and all uh, higher order conductivities uh, transverse are zero. The only conductivity can be non-zero in insulator is the linear transverse all. So the final message is that the formula for the anomalous whole conductivity, the anomalous whole conductivity tensor is simply the Berry curvature, which is extensive, divided by the volume and multiplied by a column. This is only the geometric term. That is, in a metal, there are also entries. This formula is switched to, to dimension D, can be two or three. D can be two or three, not only three. And uh, when, when they take the large system limit, the conductivity is at, at omega equals zero is equal to the, the, the very curvature at k equals zero, the flux. As I said, can be zero only if the symmetry broken, but the important point in a metal, there are always extrinsic terms. The theory of the anomalous whole effect has been much controversial until the early 2000s. And the fact that there is an intrinsic geometric term came out very clearly only, uh, I would say, 20 years ago, even, uh, even less. But there are always also intrinsic terms, so it is not easy experimentally to dis disentangle the geometrical from the extrinsic. If you have a two-dimensional two insulator instead, uh, the, the, this formula I, will become topological, become topological, and it, 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 the basic tenet of topology is that insofar as the system remains insulating, the extrinsic effect do not have any effect. So there is no extrinsic effect. The extrinsic, extrinsic features are irrelevant because it's topological. This paper by New Taules and Wu came out uh, three years after the famous paper by Taules which was at the independent electron level. So the famous paper TK and N, Taules Komoto, Nightingale, the niece was published in 82. And now we know how to go to the nonlinear. It's uh, rather easy. We go out to go to the nonlinear, we apply the same recipe. You have the new Taules adiabatic current, but now we go one order higher in K. That means we expand the omega. Instead of taking omega at k equals zero, we add one term, which is the derivative of k, we have omega times k. And the second order, all current, 
is written in this way. Uh, uh, you have a K, and now you want, uh, again, to uh, express a K, that is the vector potential, in terms of the electric field. And now, when you express the vector potential in terms of electric field, you have exactly the same factor that you had in the, in the weight. This, uh, this omega-dependent factor, which, which is needed when you express the derivative of K uh, with respect to the electric field, which means taking the derivative of A with respect to the electric field, and you have this. So this is the final formula. Uh, you have that, that you have a three index tensor, of course, which is which is uh, symmetric in beta gamma. It is anti-symmetric in alpha beta in alpha gamma. And uh, you have a term, and this is the final formula for the quadratic or conductivity. So this is not the current. A, a different with the, with the, with the, with the uh, linear hole conductivity does give a steady, cu steady current, gives an acceleration, and you need extrinsic effect to have a finite effect, of course, exactly like the Drude way. So it's a kind of Drude way. It's kind of Drude like conductivity, but it, of course it is skewed. The, the Drude like conductivity, the, the real Drude conductivity is linear, and this is just a transverse Drude like conductivity, but having the same feature. The symmetry properties are very important. Uh, remember that omega was, uh, in time reversal symmetry, omega was odd, and in, in, in inversion symmetry was even. But when you take the derivative, the property are swapped because the derivative of an even function is odd, the derivative of a function is even. So in order to have this non-zero, you necessarily, you, you, you need to have inversion symmetry broken, not tie symmetry broken. And as I said at the beginning, the exciting feature is that if the material is time reversal symmetric, there is no linear anomalous effect. All of the anomalous effect can only be quadratic. So it is not masked by a linear effect, of course. The quadratic effect is not masked by a linear one. Finally, uh, we, we go back to the formulation for independent electrons, let's say density Konchan formulation. So in this case, the many body ground state is uh, becomes a later determinant of W occupied block orbitals, which are uh, which are plane wave times peri lattice periodical functions with ener band energies. In the limit, uh, the, the case are discrete insofar as L is finite, but when L goes to infinite, K becomes a continuous variable. You reply the summation with integrals and all intensive ground state observables are K integrals, which are, if you have an insulator, they are integrals of a Brillouin zone. If, if they are meta, if you have a meta, they are integrals of the Fermi volume, that means over the, all of the occupied states, the energy, the total energy, which is extensive divided by the volume is twice because of the spin times the sum of all of the energies below the Fermi level. F is the Fermi function, which is uh, which selects uh, which uh, state to occupy, and uh, you have this quantity. The draw the weight is the derivative with respect to the flux. It is not difficult to uh, calculate it at k at the flux equals zero. It is not difficult to show that it becomes the the the, the this uh, this Fermi volume integral, where you have a second derivative with respect to the block vector, second derivative with respect to the block vector. So this is called in, this is typically called inverse effective mass of band J, because if you have a non-interacting electron in a flat potential, the kinetic energy is uh, quadratic, the energy is parabolic, and this quantity coincides, is diagonal, coincides with the inverse of the electron mass by times this alpha beta. So this is, in a sense, is the correction to the inverse electron mass due to the periodic potential. If you integrate by part, the Fermi volume integral becomes a Fermi surface because you bring, the, you bring one of the two derivatives, you bring one of the two derivatives as a derivative of F, if f is a step function, which is one for occupied states, zero uh, for, for unoccupied states, its derivative is just the delta of the Fermi surface. 
And this is what you know, because uh, there is a basic tenet of Landau Fermi liquid theory that says that charge transport only involves quasi particles with energies within KP from the Fermi level. And so, and so the, the formula integrated by part vindicates this, uh, this uh, statement. Now, the Berry curvature of band J is defined in a similar way, where now the derivative is not the derivative with respect to the flux, is the derivative with respect to the blocks vector. Notice that here we don't have the block state, we have only the periodic part of the block state, we only have the U. The, the many body Berry curvature computed at k equals zero is just the sum of one body curvatures integrated over all of the occupied states. And then you get you get the 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 uh, hull the hull linear conductivity in this form, but this is intrinsic. So that mm -hmm. means this is only what uh, what you would have for a pristine metal at k equals zero. Then you also have extrinsic parts. Uh, this result, as I say, it came out. This is particularly the result which became clear only about I would say 2005 or something like that. It was not clear before. And in two-dimensional insulator, as in the many body case, it becomes topological. So it was topological in many body case. It is topological also in two body case. Sigma, the anti-symmetric time two dimension, the anti-symmetric uh, conductivity is minus e over h bar times this integral, only uh, integrated over the occupied bands. Only the occupied bands need. You don't have a Fermi level, of course. And this is just minus e over h times c, the, the, the chair number. This is an integer known as the chair number, also known as TKNN invariant. Notice here this is an h bar, and this is an h because because you have to to uh, to book, to keep a good bookkeeping of the device you have here. Anyhow, this is the result. And now the, the inverse of E over H, this is H over E, is uh, by now the, the standard of, of uh, resistance uh, is called one Klitsi. So e, H, of, H over E in nowadays is, 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 is the unit which is called one Klitsi. <clears throat> Now, uh, it happens that many years ago, 15 years ago, for several different reasons, we, we did a simulation where we really do that because what what uh, what I what I should say one over the, the volume times Berry curvature at k equals zero is equal to this only in the large system limit because here we have an integral over k that means if if you, we don't have a sum over k we have an integral that means the system is infinite when I do this this uh, makes uh, six. Uh, Obviously, means that I'm dealing with an infinite system. Here on the left, I'm not dealing with an infinite system. I'm dealing with a finite one, and which and I have this result only in the limit of very large L. And it turns out that for some reason we did this calculation for different reasons many years ago, 15 years ago, and we had omega of zero divided by the volume, and we wanted to retrieve the, the chair number with the modern Hamiltonian, which is the famous modern Hamiltonian. And for the Aldena medium Hamiltonian, we knew that the well, sum was one for that Hamiltonian. And sure enough, our simulation uh, for that model tells you that when L goes to infinity, you retrieve the cell number. Now we want the nonlinear uh, from uh, the very curvature. I already said this one. I want the k derivative. It is it is relatively easy that I, I, when I insert a flux, the flux goes goes into an addition to the block vector. So when I take the derivative, I have to take the derivative with respect to the block vector. And the final formula is this one: it is the Fermi volume integral of the very curvature gradient is not an integral of the very curvature dipole. Is the dipole gradient. now the gradient and the dipole have the same uh, symmetry, but they are not the same thing. And this is the three uh, the, the tensor. And again, uh, since Landau Fermi liquid theory. Uh, dictates that the charge transport uh, has to do with the particle with energy within KT from Fermi level. You can uh, integrate by part and you have a Fermi surface okay. formula. Uh, 
yes, I almost finished it. I'm, I'm, I'm not. This picture is taken by Kitten. You see, it's the, the velocity, the velocity total current is zero because the velocity of the electrons within the Fermi sphere compensate all. Now, if if the, I had a current, all of the velocity are displaced to the right. So th this is a Fermi volume effect, if you want. But if I take the difference from the right and minus left, of course, uh, all of the action is on the Fermi surface. And this is what happens here. Integrating by parts, this is another equivalent formula for the uh, nonlinear quadratic uh, condition. Now, uh, this is equivalent to the formula that came out in 2015. I, it's identical. I, I told you I don't like much the derivation because they they do they apply a perturbation of frequency omega. Then you have a response of frequency two omega and a response of frequency <laughs> omega. And then at the end, you make the limit when omega goes to zero. That is, you have to sum the two. So why separate two terms when the adiabatic, uh, the adiabatic formulation gives you the two terms altogether as it must be? Now, uh, I think this is the final slide. So it's the same result. That anyhow, the semi-classical response gives the right result. I've not used the semi-classical any, anyhow, but I get the same result. The coincidence is not accidental. <coughs> final uh, summary. Generality is about the C-conductivity classical quantum mechanics. Many body Hamiltonian with the flux. I agree with the work by Korn in, in a different way. And I've shown linear longitude in a linear hole, non-linear hole. And then I've, I've shown how this converts in, in the more familiar bar structure theory with K, K uh, space. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rafael, for uh, this talk lecture. Ilya? Um, yeah, I have several questions. Probably first, <laughs> I uh, stick with that. I stick with that. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the first is more more semantic or methodological. But since this is a methodological talk, yeah, you were repeatedly uh, stating uh, that the, the true debate is a measure of inertia. Yes. Yeah. On the other uh, of of electrons in material. Yeah. On the other hand, we know that the inertia is a property of the response to the gravitational field or to acceleration yeah. of a reference frame. And uh, the, there was this famous classical experiment by Tolman, uh, Tolman Stewart, who measured the uh, free electron E over M ratio by accelerating a piece of metal. And that was a kind of confirmation that the electrons in the metal responds to the acceleration as, 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 free, as free mass particle, not the effective mass. While in your uh, drew the weight, in the true weight, we have effective mass essentially, right? So the second derivative of that. Yeah. So that's kind of a bit dangerous calling this inertia. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's... Well, I, I don't know in detail that. I can tell you something which is equally dangerous. That is, in the F sum rule, if you really sum to infinite energy, including X-ray and, and uh, ultraviolet X-ray, really infinite, then the density is not the one of the, the weight. You have to include also the density of the core electrons. So alumino would not be three electrons, would be all of the electrons yeah, because, sure. because if you sum. So in some sense, you have to, to put a cutoff. Uh, this is automatically, it's by construction, if you do special, of course, you forget about core electron. But if you really do an all electron approach and you want to be rigorous, and when the integral is from zero to infinite, you really mean infinite, then you, on, on, the sum does not sum to the valence electrons, sums to the total electrons. So, so this maybe has something to do, I don't know. No, I think here's the, the answer. At least I think I know the answer. Yeah, yeah? and the answer uh, is we'll uh, cast tomorrow at yeah. ten. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But well, in any case, yeah. I don't know. I, I have another question yes. uh, regarding this breaking the gauge invariance. Yeah, by periodic yeah, boundary yeah. conditions. Yeah. Uh, so the one of the manifestations of this is a persistent current, right? It was persistent yes. current. Yes. Yeah. So that's a persistent current. Yes. If yes. we yes. if yeah. we apply constant uh, yeah. vector potential along yeah. the loop. Yeah. Then we cannot eliminate it by gauge transformation, yes. even yes. in spite of this. Right. And, and the physical manifestation that that we, we have a persistent current. So in, in in the jargon is that cannot be gauged away. That yes, is, in, in open boundary condition, uh, the, uh, the flux can be gauged away, 
and in, right. in periodic boundary condition cannot be gauged away. Right. But then we know that the persistent current decays yeah. as a power law in the metal uh, when we increase the size of the loop. Yeah. yeah. So which means that in the thermodynamic limit, yeah. it should be kind of uh, kind of okay. And you're always, uh, in a sense, we can can gauge it away yeah, in the thermodynamic. No, this, this makes it with the fundamental difference question. between yeah. metals and insulators. That is, if you have an insulator, of course, the dual weight is zero. And even with periodic boundary condition, the flux can be gauged away in an insulator, but not in a metal. And this has to do with a very profound difference, uh, which in fact is, is the main topic of the Connors paper, that is the ground state of an insulator is, even before you probe with any probe, is qualitatively different from the ground state of a metal. Yeah, that's right. But in, in, in insulator, the decay of the persistent current is yeah. exponential. In the metal, the power law, but it still decays. In the sense that if you have an, uh, a loop of yeah. infinite size yeah. uh, with a flux and the, the, the vector potential. Yeah, but if this loop is yeah. attached to a battery, you still have the, the, the point is, I, I'm not speaking. So in the real experiment, you have a battery. No, and, and, in, on the paper, not in a real experiment. Yeah. But just on the paper. If you if you increase the size of your loop yeah. and look on the manifestation of, yeah. of this break engagement invariance on a persistent current, Keeping the uh, the amplitude of a vector potential fixed, then the persistent current will decay as a power law. I forget is one over. Uh, I, I don't see that because if you, of course, if you want you to keep a constant, you need the magnetic field which increases, which is proportional to 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 the area of the loop. You need the flux. You need the fixed flux. So how can you do with the fixed flux? No, a fixed amplitude of the vector potential. What I say, a fixed amplitude of the vector potential, yeah. which, which goes there, and then just formally on the paper, I go to the limit uh, L to infinity. Then the persistent current should go to zero. If you go to the limit while keeping the the flux proportional, so if you go to the limit, you have also to to keep the flux constant. That means the magnetic field itself. Uh, the, the, the you have an, the flux is magnitude times the area, so you have to increase uh, proportionally to the area. Okay, good. So, so maybe you can discuss also more. that model. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly maybe the there are more, fun, more, more, yeah. more elementary <laughs> question from the rest of the audience. Another question from the audience here. Yeah. If not, we have a, a question from uh, from the, the remote listener. This is uh, Nicola Mannini. Yeah, <laughs> okay, he's saying a uh, charming talk, uh, Rafael. Thanks. Uh, you introduce an effective density, but usually folks introduce an effective mass. The effective mass show, showed up later in the talk. Uh, is the reason for talking about effective density there uh, that you are still in the full many body formalism with no single electron effective theory yet? Do I understand it correctly? Uh, no, uh, because what the key quantity is an effective density over mass. And then what is really effective is the density over mass. And you can interpret as an effective density over the normal mass or a standard density over an effective mass. And I've chosen the first way. You, if you can do the reverse, let's say the density is not changed. So there are in aluminum, there are still three electrons per unit cell, but their mass is different. Okay. Or otherwise, since the quantity which enters is n over n, I prefer to say, there is an effective density and the mass is not effective. Did I get correct? This, this is an answer you, you uh, Nicola, do you agree on that? So Thank you. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question for the audience? Uh, maybe I take the chance to ask you the last question. So at some point, you, you, are, you assume that you, you do this uh, adiabatic treatment for the derivative with respect to the flux. Yes. Is it possible to go beyond this adiabatic uh, approximation? Or, uh... Yes, for different reasons. One is that you take the derivative before the infinite limit. Mm -hmm. So when you take the derivative, the spectrum is always discrete. You don't have any de degeneration. So you know, you know, in a metal, of course, the, the, the first excited state is degenerated with the ground state. But this is only after you have taken the thermodynamic limit. Instead, the process, you take the derivative first and the thermodynamic limit after. So this is one explanation. And the other explanation is, uh, is, is uh, more subtle related to the Migdal theorem, which I don't know uh, well. But anyhow, uh, we know, I would say, experimented uh, 
phonons in metals are uh, uh, routinely computed with the adiabatic approximation. So, so first principle calculation of, 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 of phonons in metal, which were pioneered in, in, in CIS, particularly by Pasquale Pavone, <laughs> and uh, they are computed within the adiabatic approximation. So, so in general, there is no problem even in metal for the adiabatic approximation. Yeah. If there are no other questions, I would suggest to uh, let's thank Rafael again. And again, Rafael is uh, here at the DMVCT to the end of the month. So if you have uh, additional questions, simply drop by his office. I suppose he's indeed in for us. Okay, so, yes, that's 